evening and good morning to all present here welcome to professor haragobinda kurana memorial lecture let us start today's program with imt theme song department uh, our senior colleague dr ashok kumar sahu professor acsa also head of the department environment sustainability department dr nk dhal okay. and all my fellow colleagues and dear scholars students and uh, fellow colleagues from other uh, departments other institute and also delegates all across india those are joining through youtube link so welcome to this memorable event today we are having and immt hosting since a group working here on dna long back in 1968 when after the discovery of molecular structure of dna how the link dna to protein was not known professor hargobin korana made tremendous contributions to the field of molecular biology by showing deciphering the genetic code which set the way forward for the molecular biologist in general and biochemist in fact he is the first scientist in the world to synthesize oligonucleotides being a chemist he has started the chemical biologist and uh, we often uh, and regard him as the founder father of chemical biologist and not only he has deciphered the genetic code he has done many accomplishments uh, discovery where whole world is geared up with the discovery of hargobind corona and to listen everything uh, we are fortunate to have professor siladitya das sharma who has what both as doctoral student at mit with professor corona and he has kindly agreed uh, to uh, give this lecture uh, government of india department of biotechnology has instituted hargobind corona innovative young biotechnologist award and in 2018 our group work on uh, working dna self assembled dna nano structure so uh, that's how our group conferred with this award so we thought it's our responsibility to celebrate hargobind corona and many of the students from kendra vidyalaya teachers and also college university students have joined to celebrate this uh, memorable event 
and today is uh, of course yesterday was the 9th january though date was not known as professor siladito also uh, telling that uh, since those days when he was born in um, punjab at that time now it is in pakistan but then it was india so date was not known but it is believed from many documents that 9th january is birthday so since yesterday was sunday we thought to celebrate today and evening is better because from us professor seladit dasar now be speaking uh, hope uh, this is how we have started the program and uh, we'll uh, learn to uh, we'll very happy to learn many um, the scientific attitude of professor corona which is very uh, keen in his uh, publications in his uh, postdocs and doctoral students more than uh, i believe uh, 150 or uh, postdoctoral students have been more working trained on his guidance Uh, so with this i welcome all the delegates students scholars and um, fellow colleagues to this centenary celebration of hargobin corona who is very unique and uh, professor siladit das sharma who has agreed that be great thank you and welcome again thank you dr subuddhi now i invite uh, dr ashok kumar sahu head spbd to give the welcome address and also introduce today's guest yeah very good morning uh, professor our chief guest today's chief guest professor siladita dasharma and uh, good evening to all my colleagues uh, here uh, students ladies and, and gentlemen i have been uh, it is my privilege to introduce uh, professor uh, uh, siladita dasharma before that i'll just tell a brief about my institute that is a csr institute of uh, minerals and metals technology which was established on in the year 1964 as a regional research laboratory bhuvaneswar in the eastern part of india under the aegis of the council of scientific and industrial research new delhi it was renamed in 2007 with a renowned research focus and growth strategy to be a leader in the areas of minerals and metals resource engineering the institute has expertise in conducting basic research and technology oriented programs in a wide range of subjects to address the r&d problems of mining minerals and metal industry and ensure their sustainable sustainable development for the last one decade the main thrust of r&d at csr rmt has been to empower indian industries to meet the challenges of globalization by providing advanced and zero waste process know how and consultant service for the commercial exploitation of natural resources through public private partnership approach it is also carrying out nick in uh, processing of advanced materials for greater value addition working on resource use efficiency of critical raw materials we have uh, eight uh, different departments that is advanced materials technology central characterization metal chemistry design and project engineering environmental sustainability hydro and electrometallurgy mineral processing and process engineering and instrumentation to support this r&d activities and uh, it, with this brief introduction uh, introduction by institute i'll uh, i mean privilege to introduce our uh, uh, chief guest today's chief guest professor siladita das sharma professor das sharma uh, has uh, had the privilege of knowing professor purana as his phd mentor during the late 1970s and early 80s when the laboratory was tra uh, transitioning to membrane biology setting in this period his laboratory employed gene synthesis um, uh, metagenesis in combination with membrane biochemistry to address functional biological questions which continue to be studied by his many students yes, associate as well as uh, others professor kurana uh, was an inspirational mentor whose support was instrumental in launching Uh, his own phd career in micro microbial genomics and biotechnology in 1986 in this talk professor dasarma will provide an overview of professor kurana's education career briefly summarize his greatest scientific achievements and provide insights into the qualities which led to his monumental scientific contribution to chemistry and biology and an enduring legacy professor siladitya da dasman education uh, 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 is uh, here uh, i'll just tell about his education background 
His deed is a biochemistry, a PhD in 1984 under Professor uh, uh, Harbhavin Purana at AI, uh, MIT. He completed his postdoctoral studies in uh, uh, during his 1984-96 at Harvard in Medical School, Department of Genetics and Massachusetts General Hospital. He was a visiting scientist in Pasteur Institute in 1986. He has been a faculty member at University of Massachusetts Amherst, Department of Microbiology during 1986-2001. And since 2001, he has been in the University of Maryland Biotechnology Institute and School of Medicine, Department of Microbiology and Immunology from 2010 till present. He is having a rich experience in academic career, more than 35 plus years in his academic career, trained over 150 research students in lab with 162 publications and many invited lectures, taught undergraduate and graduate students courses in molecular genetics and bioinformatics and genomics. Founded and directed the UMass Amherst Molecular Biology and Biotechnology Computer Facility. Founded and directed University of Maryland Baltimore graduate program track in genomics and bioinformatics. His research accomplishments are discovery of trans, uh, transposable elements in archaea, promoter function, left handed jet DNA, genomic, genomic, uh, genome sequencing of fast extreme. Allopile, protein nanoparticle biotechnology for vaccine and drug delivery, structure function of poly extreme polyproteins, purple earth hypothesis in astrobiology. With this uh, brief introduction, I, 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 I tell about one of my colleagues, that uh, Dr. Uma Kansubudi, who is instrumental in conducting this uh, centenary uh, oration uh, program in our institute. Our colleague, Dr. Subudhi, is working in the Department of E and Environment Sustainability has initiated the uh, field of DNA nanotechnology. His lab is uh, fo focusing on self-assembled DNA nanostructure, DNA nanostructure and genetic regulation, rare earth element-based B to Z transition and left-handed DNA and quadruplex. Professor Siladitya Dasharma also working in environmental technology, which is very close to our issues in general and environmental department in particular. I am uh, confident that his lecture will be very inspiring to all of us here and to all the scholars and participant delegates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we will now listen to Professor Siladitya Dasarma. Yeah, I, I request Professor Siladitya to uh, uh, start his presentation and uh, 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 give us more knowledge about his, uh, the, uh, about our uh, Professor Purana, outstanding uh, our scientist and uh, Nobel laureate Professor Purana. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Basu and Dr. Subudi. Uh, it's it's uh, a great pleasure to be here and uh, welcome to everyone uh, who's listening today. I hope everybody can hear me and see my slide. Yes, yes. please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I will be speaking today primarily about Professor Karana's work on the genetic code and synthetic biology. And in particular, I would like to reminisce on uh, my experiences in his laboratory of this visionary scientist. Uh, Professor Karana had a very long career spanning six decades, starting in 1952 and going all the way until 2007 when he was uh, in his mid 80s. And he had some remarkable achievements during the course of his life. Uh, he did the synthesis of uh, a very complicated nucleotide cofactor, coenzyme A. Uh, he also pioneered the synthesis of DNA and DNA oligonucleotides of defined sequence, uh, which allowed him to decipher the genetic code. Uh, he went on to do the first complete synthesis of, of uh, genes, including functional genes. Uh, 
And then as Dr. Basu mentioned, uh, the mechanism of uh, light-driven transmembrane ion translocation as his laboratory uh, transitioned into membrane biology. Uh, and I uh, also added that he also pioneered archaeal genetics during this process. And uh, finally, in the last part of his career, he studied mammalian visual system and signal transduction. He won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for deciphering the genetic code in 1968 at the age of 44. And you can see his medal on this slide. In addition, he was recognized with many, many other awards. Uh, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences in the US in 1966. He won the Horvitz Prize, uh, the Lasker Award, and in 1987, he was awarded the presidential, the National Medal of Science by the President of the United States. He also won many awards in India. He won the Padma Presidential Award. Uh, he won the J.C. Bose Medal. And he was also uh, elected a foreign member of the Indian Academy of Sciences. In addition, he also was recognized in many other countries, including Canada, the United Kingdom, Germany, Italy, Japan, uh, the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. So I was really privileged to be a graduate student with uh, Professor Karana. Uh, I was there uh, from 1979 to 1984. And uh, I would like to provide uh, in the first part of my talk a uh, brief uh, introduction to his education and career and uh, some personal reflections. And then I would like to highlight his accomplishments in science. And then finally, close with uh, how inspirational a mentor he was and his scientific legacy. So he was born in uh, a small village in Punjab in uh, 1922, early January, uh, perhaps uh, today, or perhaps yesterday. A uh, hundred years ago, and his father, uh, Sri Ganput Rai, was a tax collector, and his mother, Srimati Krishna Devi Korana. Uh, he was the youngest of five children. He had three elder brothers and one elder sister, and the, received his primary education in the village. Uh, for high school, he went to a nearby city. He excelled in school and won a scholarship to attend Punjab University, where he earned a BSc Honors First Class in Chemistry in 1943 and a MSc Honors First Class in 1945 uh, under uh, his mentor, Professor Mohan Singh. This was a very turbulent time in history. Uh, World War II was ongoing between 1939 and 1945, and the Indian independence was won in 1947. But Karana was a very focused student, and he was able to win a scholarship to study abroad in the UK through the Department of Agriculture uh, the government of India. He studied organic chemistry at the University of Liverpool with Dr. Alexander Robertson, a fellow of the Royal Society, uh, for three years and earned his PhD in 1948, studying alkaloids and other natural products. Uh, the structure shown is for uh, Biolison. Uh, which is a plant alkaloid. 
And uh, you can see that it had a ring structure with a nitrogen uh, not too dissimilar from nucleic acid. After his PhD, he went to uh, Zurich, Switzerland, still on his Indian scholarship, and worked with Vladimir Prelog at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology for 11 months. And after this time, he returned back to India in 1949. This was in the immediate aftermath of uh, uh, the Indian independence. And uh, very unfortunately, he was not able to uh, find employment in India. So he turned back to the UK and uh, he was offered a uh, Nuffield Fellowship to return uh, this time to Cambridge University uh, to work uh, as a postdoctoral fellow under Sir Alexander Todd. Uh, and uh, the research area here was nucleotides and nucleotide coenzyme studies. So after two years, he had the good fortune of meeting Gordon Strum from British Columbia. Uh, he, he had come to Cambridge to recruit an organic chemist for a new institute in uh, Canada. And he interviewed Professor Karana and uh, offered him that position, which uh, Professor Karana took and uh, went to Canada in 1952. Uh, by then, he was married to Esther Sibler, who, who is uh, a, a Swiss. Uh, uh, who he had met when he was in Dr. Prelog's lab. They want to, uh, went on to have a family of three children uh, over the course of the 1950s uh, in Canada. After eight years, uh, Dr. Karana moved as professor and co-director to the Institute of Enzyme Research at the University of Wisconsin, Madison in the United States. And then 10 years later, in 1970, he again moved to uh, take a position as professor of chemistry and biology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Those of you who know MIT uh, will know that it's a highly interdisciplinary, interactive place. All of the buildings are interconnected. And uh, this included biology and chemistry, uh, which are connected via a bridge. Uh, Dr. Krana was professor of both biology and chemistry, uh, but he was physically in the chemistry building. And this is the chemistry building that you can see. Uh, and my first meeting with Professor Karana was in the spring of 1979. I had been admitted as a graduate into the graduate program. Um, and I was visiting as a prospective uh, student. Uh, and I found that uh, Dr. Karana had a very large laboratory. He was working together with Dr. Raj Bhandari, who was formerly a uh, postdoctoral associate in his lab, was now a, uh, an independent faculty member. But their two laboratories worked together as a single unit that occupied the entire fifth floor of the chemistry building. So I met with Dr. Krana in his office, and we discussed his uh, research. Um, in fact, he showed me uh, that uh, he had published the total synthesis of two genes, the alanine tRNA gene from yeast and a tyrosine suppressor tRNA gene from E. coli. And uh, the yeast tRNA gene uh, had been published in Nature in 1970. And then uh, there were 13 papers that uh, were published together in a single issue of the Journal of Molecular Biology. So the entire issue of that journal had been devoted to work from his laboratory. And uh, in 1978 and 79, there were 17 papers on the total synthesis of the tyrosine suppressor transfer RNA, which was uh, in the Journal of Biological Chemistry. However, he said that uh, 
his laboratory had ch changed its focus entirely and was going to be focusing, if I joined, in uh, work on membrane proteins. And uh, although he hadn't published the amino acid sequence of Bacteroidopsin, that was uh, an area that he was actively working toward. And so I decided that I would join his group and that of Raj Bhandari's, and uh, that I would uh, uh, enter the program through the biology department, which offered the PhD in biochemistry. Uh, so I joined his group, and uh, the group had some wonderful traditions. Uh, one of them was a, an annual group photo. Uh, this is a group photo from 1983. And you can see Dr. Krana standing at the center and uh, Dr. Raj Bhandari to his left. Uh, most of the group members were uh, postdoctoral associates. Uh, there were two graduate students, uh, uh, including myself, and I'm uh, the fellow who is uh, kneeling uh, at the left side of the, uh, the group. Uh, another tradition in the group was regular group meetings. In fact, uh, Dr. Krana had meetings every day of the week, including Saturday. Uh, the group meeting started Monday morning uh, with a three hour uh, meeting from 9 a.m. to noon where two students or two group members would uh, present their research for the last uh, several months. And uh, one of the requirements was to provide a uh, written lab report on Friday prior to the Monday so that Dr. Krana would have a chance to review the work in detail over the weekend. Uh, another memorable meeting was the Thursday afternoon tea clubs. So Dr. Krana would prepare tea for the group and he would use a, a giant Erlenmeyer flask. I think it was six liters. And uh, he would also provide cookies. And, and this was a more informal meeting where uh, group members would present their latest research. And then he also started with the Bacteroidopsin group, a Saturday morning meeting. And uh, to entice people to come into the laboratory on Saturday morning, he would provide us with donuts. Uh, in addition to the, all this work, he would also uh, invite group members to leisure activities such as uh, picnics at his New Hampshire cottage. And uh, especially for foreign students, uh, he would have them over uh, at his home for holiday dinners. Uh, Dr. Karana also enjoyed uh, going to scientific meetings and encouraged his uh, students to go. In fact, the very first summer after I joined, he took me to uh, a Gordon Research Conference. Uh, these are small conferences that occur in uh, just north of Boston and New Hampshire. And uh, they're on specific topics. And the one that he took me to was on nucleic acids. And we went back again in 1982. And on the left, you can see a picture, a group photo, where you can see Dr. Krana is actually standing at the back, and I'm sort of standing uh, in the front on the right. Uh, Dr. Krana also went to a number of uh, international meetings, including several in India. Uh, there was one in 1983, International Congress on Genetics in New Delhi. Uh, which uh, both he and I actually attended, and uh, that was uh, quite a uh, uh, wonderful experience. In addition, uh, Professor Krana had many, many visitors. Many eminent scientists would visit his lab, and we would have small discussions in his, uh, in his office. And uh, as I said in his office, uh, one of the memories that comes back is that he had a, uh, a wood block on a side table, and on that wood block was uh, written uh, "Secret to Success." A very a temptation to open this. When you opened it, what did it say? Hard work. And this really epitomized 
Dr. Karana's uh, philosophy. So uh, during the five years I spent in his laboratory, uh, I co-authored three papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from 1982 to 1984. Uh, these papers were also uh, co-written with uh, Professor Rajmandari, and uh, the three of us uh, wrote these papers together, uh, primarily by hand and typewriter, because this was in the pre-word uh, processing and uh, personal computer days. And uh, Dr. Krana in particular liked to do cutting and pasting uh, as he moved uh, passages around. And in this case, he would literally cut the passages with scissors out and paste them with uh, scotch tape into different parts. So by the spring of 1984, uh, I had completed my, uh, my thesis work and I defended my thesis on April 27th. And this photograph, a uh, favorite of mine, was taken after my, my PhD defense. And uh, my thesis uh, title page is shown on the right. So uh, now I'd like to move on to uh, his uh, accomplishments in, in science. And uh, I just wanted to start with this quote. Uh, if you are doing research in both chemistry and biology, you're involved in a lot of excitement. And that does not leave one much time for anything else. Uh, this is a quote from Professor Karana, and it really epitomizes his philosophy of life. This is the way that uh, he could continue his research for six decades. And uh, another aspect of his work was that he worked as a large team. Even back in the 1950s, you can see that he had, uh, I think, 10 people in his group at the uh, BCRC. And another uh, group member uh, on the very left is Michael Smith, and he also went on to win the Nobel Prize. So, uh, the area that uh, Professor Karana focused on initially was the development of tools for nucleic acid synthesis. And nucleic acids are iterative and require iterative synthesis. And so with each successive step, uh, the yields have to be as high as possible in order to have a final uh, yield high enough for the uh, experiment to be successful. And also side reactions for each step should be minimized. So he made a, a decision to use a condensing agent, uh, particularly the one on the left, DCC, dicyclohexyl carbodiimide. And this condensing agent was uh, extremely valuable in his work. And uh, another quote from Dr. Karana is that if you want to break new ground in science, you have to walk the path alone. So <clears throat> the catalytic reaction that's catalyzed by uh, or promoted by DCC is the uh, condensation of two nucleotide bases into a dinucleotide. So the dinucleotide could then be uh, condensed into a tetranucleotide, again, using DCC as shown on the left. And on the right, you can see that uh, there are several protecting groups that were used, uh, which could be added and removed in order to uh, direct the synthesis of the appropriate sequence desired. So the five prime end could be protected using a methoxy trital group, which could then be removed using acid, or the three prime end could be uh, acetylated and uh, could be removed using uh, uh, hydroxyl. Um, and uh, amines could be protected using uh, methoxybenzoate. So this was the general process for synthesis of oligonucleotides. 
Uh, the crowning achievement during this time, however, uh, by 1960, was the uh, synthesis of coenzyme A, which is one of the most complex uh, nucleotide cofactors or coenzymes uh, that exists. And it also plays a central role in metabolism uh, of fatty acids and the TCA cycle. Uh, nearly 5% of all uh, enzymes in the cell utilize coenzyme A as a cofactor. So the cofactor is, has three different components. As you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, there's an adenosine phosphorylated adenosine, uh, there's pantothenic acid, and there's also um, amino ethane thiol. So there are the two final steps in uh, synthesis. It's a, it's a very complicated uh, uh, synthetic pathway, uh, but both of those steps require DCC for the condensation. So in the final step, uh, actually, the condensation produced a phosphoric anhydride uh, right here. And uh, that was done under anhydrous conditions. And in the previous step, a cyclic phosphodiester with a protecting uh, uh, group was also produced using DCC. So with the successful synthesis of coenzyme A, Uh, Professor Karana moved his group to Wisconsin. Now, during the 1950s, there were other developments that were occurring in the field of biochemistry and genetics, including in 1953, the double helical DNA structure and base pairing had been discovered. And by 1955, protein synthesis had uh, been shown to occur in ribosomes together with messenger RNAs and transfer RNAs. And by 1958, the central dogma of molecular biology was discovered that information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. And by the early 1960s, it was clear that there was a collinearity between the DNA and the polypeptides through genetic, primarily genetic experiments. However, because DNA could not, had not been sequenced yet, uh, it wasn't uh, the genetic code that would specify the sequence of amino acids and proteins was not clear. How was the sequence of A's, C's, G's, and T's in DNA translated into the 20 amino acids and proteins? This required polynucleotides of known sequence. And Professor Karana's lab synthesized dinucleotides, trinucleotides, and tetranucleotides in double-stranded form. His lab was the only lab that could uh, readily do this at that time. And um, in addition, he was able to take these short oligonucleotides and polymerize them into repeating polymeric DNA sequences and transcribe them into RNA polymers. So uh, this slide shows the polymerization of the repeating polymers through multiple rounds using DNA polymerase and deoxynucleotide triphosphates. So if, it, if you use a homopolymer, say T, a poly T and poly A, hybridize those, add DNA polymerase with uh, deoxy TTP and ATP, you would obtain a polymer, a DNA essentially, of a uh, poly A hybridized with poly T. And similarly, you could take repeating dinucleotides, hybridize, extend, and this could be done through multiple rounds, not unlike PCR, uh, and poly D, G, D, C, A could be synthesized. And the fidelity of the synthesis could be checked not by DNA sequencing, by, but by another process called nearest neighbor analysis. So he showed that using these repeating dinucleotides, trinucleotides, and tetranucleotides, he could obtain polymer, DNA polymers of those sequences. 
then he could take those DNA polymers and transcribe them into RNA with RNA polymerase and ribonucleotide triphosphates. So here are some examples with poly uh, TGCA, uh, RNA polymerase could convert either strand depending on which nucleotides were added. If A and C were added, one would obtain poly CA. If U and G were added, he would obtain poly UG. Uh, similarly, with the trinucleotides and the tetranucleotides, if uh, CTP was omitted, he would obtain poly GUA or poly GAUA. Or if uh, GTP was omitted, he would get poly UAC or poly UAUC. So once he had the messengers, the RNAs, uh, he could then proceed with an in vitro translation with these defined polynucleotides. So for instance, with poly CA, uh, when he programmed in vitro translation, he obtained uh, polypeptides with repeating two amino acids. So in the, in the first case, it was a repeating polymer of threonine and histidine. In the second case, it was a polymer of cysteine, uh, uh, cysteine and valine. Uh, when he took the uh, polytrinucleotides, he obtained homopolymers. For instance, in the polyGUA, he obtained valine, polyvalene and polyserine. In the case of uh, UAC, he obtained three different polymers, tyrosine, threonine, and leucine. And in the case of the tetranucleotides, he obtained either uh, short di or tri peptides, such as in the case of GAUA, he obtained uh, spartic acid isoleucine, or in the case of AUAC, he obtained uh, a polymer of uh, four, pep uh, four pro uh, amino acids, uh, tyrosine, isoleucine, serine, and leucine. So taking all of this together, he was able to conclude that the genetic code was a triplet code, and there was considerable redundancy. Most codons, most amino acids were encoded by more than one codon. The exceptions were uh, methionine and uh, tryptophan. And methionine was coded by an AUG, as well as actually a GUG under certain circumstances and constituted the start site for translation. And he was also able to tell which codons were stop codons, and there were three of those. So putting all of that together, uh, the genetic code table uh, became complete. Uh, and this work, of course, uh, was also uh, contributed to by uh, Robert Hawley, who uh, was a, uh, did work on tRNAs, and Marshall Nirenberg, uh, who also uh, de decoded the, the genetic code. And by 1966, the entire code had been uh, completed, and uh, workers had shown that translation systems from uh, all different types of organisms, bacteria, even archaea, uh, plants, and animals, all had the same universal genetic code. So this was a profound discovery, and it has tremendous implications uh, for biology, for chemistry, uh, for evolution. Uh, in, in fact, it is the strongest evidence that all life on Earth originated from a common ancestor. So, as soon as the genetic code was complete, uh, the Corona Lab uh, moved on to the next project, which was complete gene synthesis. And because genes are much longer than codons, they are, uh, it was necessary to encode polynucleotides of defined sequences that were 100 or longer. And initially, uh, Dr. Krana used the amplification method uh, to design genes. And that's shown on the left. 
essentially by synthesis of oligonucleotides that are partially overlapping uh, and using DNA polymerase to fill in the gaps, uh, the sequences could be extended and then additional oligonucleotides could be uh, hybridized after denaturation uh, and then those could be extended and so on, uh, similar to the polymerase chain uh, reaction method. However, uh, this approach was not uh, necessary after the discovery of several new enzymes, including polynucleotide kinase, which could add a phosphate group to the phi prime end of oligonucleotides, which was required for the next enzyme, DNA ligase, which would make uh, a seal in a NIC in DNA. Essentially, it would uh, put in an uh, phosphodiester bond. And also restriction enzymes were discovered in the 19, early 1970s that allowed uh, DNA to be cut and repasted back using DNA ligase. So uh, in 1970, uh, the synthesis of the yeast uh, alanine tRNA was completed. It was 77 base pairs long and uh, the Corona lab uh, synthesized 17 oligonucleotides between five and 20 nucleotides long. And uh, as you can see that they're overlapping uh, segments uh, and the gaps between the segments were uh, sealed with DNA ligase after uh, phosphorylation by polynucleotide kinase. And then the three segments were then joined together. And then the third the segment was actually, there were two alternative strategies one worked better than the other because of uh, chemical properties of specific oligonucleotides. And uh, Marv Crothers, who was uh, instrumental in the synthesis uh, of uh, oligonucleotides in the Corona lab and then beyond, was uh, 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 mentioned that the synthesis of the first gene required an estimated 20 man years of work. Well, the next uh, gene required even more time and effort. Uh, this was a functional uh, tyrosine suppressor tRNA gene, and that was completed in 1979, the year I joined his group. Um, this was a 126 base pair long gene with 56 base pairs additional for promoter and 25 for the three prime uh, terminator region. Uh, there were 26 oligonucleotides uh, of 16 nucleotides average lengths. So this required considerably more gene synthesis. However, uh, it was possible by then to actually show that this gene was functional in vivo by insertion into either a plasmid or a phage vector, uh, introduction into uh, E. coli uh, mutant, uh, because this was a suppressor tRNA, it could suppress certain mutations in E. coli called amber mutations. Um, it, the lambda would integrate into the chromosome uh, and the suppression of E. coli or lambda amber mutations could be confirmed uh, genetically by gene function. And also the authentic transcription and processing of the gene could be shown in vitro. So all of this uh, was terrific, but uh, Professor Karana was not satisfied and he had moved on then to researching membrane proteins. and. Uh, the membrane protein that he first focused on was bacteriodopsin, which is made by a purple organism, Halobacterium. Uh, it contains uh, a large quantity of uh, purple membrane uh, protein and uh, is also a member of the third domain of life, the archaea. And uh, this protein was exceptional because it would form a two-dimensional lattice in the cell membrane. And electron microscopy had shown that uh, it traverses the membrane seven times. It has seven transmembrane alpha helical segments. It also binds to a retinal chromophore uh, and uh, it catalyzes the uh, transfer of a hydrogen ion or a proton across the membrane in response to light. So it's a light driven proton pump. And indeed, uh, two other workers had shown that 
membrane vesicles containing bacteriodopsin and mitochondrial ATPase could synthesize ATP when uh, exposed to light. So light will drive protons from the outside to the inside of the vesicle that would create a proton motive gradient, which could then be used using the ATPase to drive ATP synthesis. So Professor Karana's uh, first achievement with uh, Vectrodopsin was to sequence the protein, it's 248 amino acids, and he wanted to understand how this protein is, uh, catalyzes the transport of the proton across the membrane. So he wanted to uh, uh, get a hold of the, the gene. Uh, he identified a four amino acid region, which based on the genetic code has the least redundancy. There are two tryptophanes and a glutamic acid. Uh, the tryptophanes are coded by a single codon and glutamic acid is encoded by two codons. So he did a back translation and cDNA synthesis. So the laboratory made two oligonucleotides. It made both uh, nucleotides for the glutamic acid uh, codon uh, and they made a guess about the isoleucine codon which is which uh, actually has uh, isoleucine is coded by three different codons in the genetic code. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, they were able to use those primers to successfully synthesize a, a copy DNA using the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Uh, it was about 80 nucleotides long. And because the phi prime end of the gene contains a inverted repeat, they also obtained a second strand using uh, uh, the reverse transcriptase. Um, and then this cDNA could be cloned after treatment with uh, single-stranded nuclease and addition of linkers. So the bacteriodopsin gene was one of the first archaeal genes to be cloned. And uh, it's also showed that the archaea also used the same genetic code. Uh, in addition, the bacteriodopsin uh, protein was shown to have a very unusual signal sequence of about 13 amino acids at the end terminus. And it also showed that the gene did not have a bacterial type of promoter, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, at uh, upstream of the gene. So, my, one of my projects in the lab was to determine whether or not there is a promoter there or whether the promoter is further upstream. So the way in which uh, I proceeded to do this was through uh, purification of the messenger RNA and five prime end analysis. Uh, the mRNA was purified by hybrid selection. And then I tested for the labeling at the five prime end using uh, a viral capping enzyme. This is a eukaryotic capping process, which requires um, a uh, GTP. So primary transcripts have three phosphates at the five prime end, a triphosphate, uh, and can be capped in vitro using the capping enzyme. Uh, if the alpha phosphate is labeled, the one that's red, then uh, that ends up at the five prime end of the messenger RNA. And if that labeled messenger RNA is hydrolyzed using various different enzymes, one can do five prime end analysis. And you can see on the left panel that uh, the five prime end was a G. And then uh, by a process of RNA sequencing called 2D homochromatography, uh, the sequence of the five prime end of the RNA could be determined to be GC, AUG, UUG, which corresponded to the AUG start site for uh, bacteriodopsin synthesis. The other project that I worked on uh, in uh, Dr. Trana's lab was the development of halobacterium genetics. And in particular, we discovered 
transposable elements which inactivate the bacteriodopsin gene. So uh, mutants of the Halobacterium uh, bacteriodopsin overproducer were observed at high frequency. Uh, there were two different types. I focused on the orange variety, which had lost the ability only to uh, produce the purple membrane, as you can see in the sucrose gradients on the bottom. And uh, on the right are uh, what's, what are restriction maps to show where the insertions occurred. And there were two different types of insertions. Uh, they were called ISH1 and ISH2 for insertion sequence from Halobacterium. The ISH1 element would insert into the bacteriodopsin gene at a specific site in both orientations. And this could be seen both from the sequencing analysis as well as uh, imaging in an electron microscope in a process called heteroduplex mapping. Uh, the ISH2 element would insert at different locations in the gene, including a site that was 100 bases upstream of the transcription start point. And so therefore it helped to define what the archaeal promoter was. And this, all of this work launched my independent career in archaeal biology, uh, which, which I continued after postdoctoral training uh, and uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and then at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. But the Karana's uh, focus on his uh, goal was uh, was one of his main characteristics. And he his focus was to determine the mechanism of ion translocation. So he proceeded to synthesize the bacteriodopsin gene. Uh, that was about 757 base pairs. It required 28 oligonucleotides ranging in size from 21 to 69 nucleotides. Uh, he included an E. coli promoter and expressed it in E. coli, and uh, he produced uh, the bacteriodopsin in E. coli, reconstituted it with retinal and the lipid membrane, did side-directed mutagenesis and functional analysis. So all of this was a lot of work, um, and uh, what he found was the following. Uh, he found that uh, the retinal binds to a uh, lysine, lysine 216, in a shift's base. And uh, that proton in the shift's base, uh, during the photocycling that occurs when illuminated with light, is transferred to aspartic acid 85, which is the, the red D uh, over here. And then uh, the proton is extruded to the outside. That's followed by an uptake of a proton to aspartic 96, and then transfer of that proton to the shift space. So that completed the uh, photocycle necessary for pumping of a proton from the inside to the outside of the cell in response to light. So. Having achieved his intended goal, Professor Karana then moved on to another retinal protein, rhodopsin, uh, which is part of the mammalian visual system. And uh, this protein, while not being an ion pump, uh, has a retinal chromophore. Uh, in this case, it's a uh, 11 cis rather than an all trans retinal, and that binds to a lysine in the last of seven transmembrane alpha helices. So it is also a 7 TM protein. And this uh, is a light receptor that performs a uh, vital function in vision. Uh, instead of pumping protons, though, it is, uh, interacts with a G protein, as shown in the uh, textbook diagram here. Uh, this is rhodopsin, and this is uh, transducin, which has three subunits. 
and that uh, initiates a whole cascade that res is responsible in the signaling uh, for uh, mammalian vision. Uh, the Corona Lab also proceeded to synthesize the rhodopsin gene, which is even larger than the vector rhodopsin gene. It's 1,057 base pairs long. It required 72 oligonucleotides between 15 and 40 in size. And you can see this is the strategy that he used for synthesis. Um, so he spent about 20 years uh, studying the rhodopsin uh, structure and function and signal transduction and had achievements, uh, too many achievements to, uh, to share with you here. But just to summarize, uh, after gene synthesis, he expressed the uh, protein in mammalian cells. Uh, he also uh, synthesized and expressed two subunits of the G protein transducin. Uh, he purified and reconstituted rhodopsin and the methods that he developed are widely used for these, these types of proteins called GPCRs, which are uh, very common in mammalian cells and are drug targets. He identified uh, the G protein binding site on rhodopsin. Uh, he also identified the retinal binding pocket and the shift space conurion that's important for spectral tuning. And he identified the first rhodopsin mutant uh, responsible for autosomal uh, retinitis uh, pigmentosa, which, is, which causes blindness. So uh, those are some of the highlights of the research that uh, Professor Karana's laboratory did over the course of the six decades. And so in the final part of the talk, I would like to turn now uh, to uh, how he inspired and, and his scientific legacy. So Professor Karana was, uh, was a very inspiring mentor and it was his character that was inspiring. He was highly committed to free and open scientific pursuit. And he was very much dedicated to teaching the scientific method to his students and his postdocs. And he had an unending need to expand our knowledge through the scientific research. And why did he do this? Uh, well, he said that such scientific work would be necessary to solve the environmental, economic, and health problems that face uh, humanity. And I do have the basic faith that the survival of our civilization is not even going to be possible without the proper use of science. And I think you all there at uh, the Institute uh, can certainly understand and uh, appreciate that perspective. Um, his legacy is nothing other than monumental. Uh, he, he established the foundation of chemistry and biology. Uh, the genetic code work, the, the code itself is routinely used to translate nearly all sequence geno genes into protein products. And there are some 300,000 plus genomes that have been determined. And they're all using uh, the same code for translation, with very few exceptions. Oligonucleotide synthesis, which is routine and automated, can be used for gene synthesis, protein expression, mutagenesis, and recently even whole genome synthesis. This is a new field that's been spawned called synthetic biology. And the many technologies developed for membrane proteins, uh, vector rhodopsin and rhodopsin, are commonly employed for many other membrane proteins using, uh, including many uh, uh, drug targets. And the six decades of work uh, resulted in hundreds 
of postdoctoral associates being trained and a small number of graduate students. And they were all inspired by Professor Karana and the, they are carrying out the mantle of rigorous science that he's established. So I want to leave you with just a few quotes, a few more quotes from Professor Karana. Um, he was certainly a visionary. Uh, he, he said uh, after the genetic code, I wish to conclude by hazarding the following rather long range predictions. In the years ahead, genes are going to be synthesized. The next steps would be to learn to manipulate the information content of genes and to learn to insert them into and delete them from the genetic systems. When in the distant future, all of this comes to pass, the temptation to change our biology will be very strong. And another uh, part of Professor Krana's character was his generosity, both in for his students and his teachers. Yeah, for, about his teachers, he said, uh, in my own scientific development, I was most fortunate in coming under the influence of a number of very great scientists. Vladimir Prelog made me see the beauty in chemistry work and effort. Later in biochemistry, I came under the influence of Fritz Lippmann, who was so gifted in integrating ideas, and Arthur Kornberg, who taught me stringency in biochemical experimentation. Association with Francis Crick during and since work on genetic code has been intellectually stimulating and inspiring. Much later, Ephraim Racker introduced me to membrane biochemistry. I had the uh, pleasure of visiting Professor Karana's new laboratory at MIT after uh, a new biology building was built in 1995. And uh, he, he invited me to give a seminar to his group. And I presented him on that occasion with a, um, a copy of uh, Tagore's Gitanjali. And uh, he wrote me this letter afterwards. And uh, he said, uh, I would fondly treasure the 1913 edition of Gitanjali that you brought me. Thank you deeply for this unique gift. It also brings back many memories of my youthful days when we held Reverend Nanat Tagore in great affection and respect for his physical, uh, for his spiritual uh, leadership in our independence movement. So in closing, uh, Dr. Karana was a visionary. Uh, he was inspirational. And he had made, con he has made contributions to science, which will last um, another hundred years and perhaps longer. I think the world owes uh, this great man, a debt of thanks. So with that, I thank you all uh, for your attention and I thank and I, uh, you for uh, the invitation. Thank you, Seth. Uh, let Owen Kumar, yes. Owen Kumar ji. Yes. Uh, uh, Thank you, Professor. Uh, it was a really a wonderful lecture all throughout. I could see a large number of appreciation, like inspiring, motivational. Uh, happy to be part of this lecture. These kind of um, comments I am seeing in the chat box. We are very much delighted to have you for this uh, webinar series. And uh, as such, I don't find any specific query but however, a huge uh, set of appreciations are going on in the chat box. Now, I think uh, Dr. Samba you can, you can, uh, you can uh, please uh, raise your query. Samba Shivarao. Yeah, Dr. Sarma, it was nice to listen. Nice to listen from you about uh, uh, my query is. Uh, 
you know uh, everything that is happening with the dna are the uh, information passes of information is nothing but uh, uh, you know molecules uh, molecules uh, do you agree with me this line uh, 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 you know you name it any carbon uh, functions or whatever the mode so uh, uh, where is the where is the bio uh, you know where is the life here everything is a molecules uh, everything is a molecules then where is the life yes ab uh, absolutely it's but, uh, it is yeah, yeah it's nothing but another chemistry that we do in our, in our hydrometallurgy or in our institute maybe the molecules number of protons electrons and uh, is changing but it's nothing but uh, uh, you know the same fundamentals in a different orientation then uh, where is the life uh, that we are having that we used to say uh, are uh, yeah yeah uh, are, are you uh, yeah please you can i am glad to listen listen from you Th thank you very much for that that wonderful question um, and comment. Um, and, and certainly, uh, Professor Karana would agree. Um, and uh, the, uh, in fact, if you think about his career and his life, um, he essentially was a chemist who showed the chemistry of of life, how that occurs, and that there was no vital force in uh, in biology that couldn't be explained by chemical laws. Uh, so the whole synthesis of the gene and synthesis of DNA all reflect the uh, basic uh, properties and the basic laws of chemistry are followed in, in biology. Um, it also brings to mind the recent uh, movement to uh, visit uh, our sister planet Mars to see whether there might be life on that planet. Uh, and uh, it make, makes uh, people think about what, what constitutes life, what really defines whether something is living or not. Uh, so these are discussions that are, that are ongoing and is all life based on carbon? And, and you and your institute have a much wider appreciation of the periodic table than just carbon and uh, hydrogen and nitrogen and phosphorus. So, um, th so there are some very fundamental questions in science that are still wide open that would require a very interdisciplinary group like yours to be able to answer. Um, so I really appreciate that that comment and that question, uh, and uh, you know I would I would be happy to talk more with you about that. Thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Sarma. I, I will be in touch with you. I am I am really curious to know. I strongly feel there is nothing like life. It is all uh, molecules. Uh, are fundamentally it is nothing but electrons, protons, neutrons. Even you, myself, are even this computer. Uh, you know, there is nothing like life. We have named somehow for unknowing chemistry. We put it as a life. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, but how? Right. How do I? How do I put my appreciation for your question into into chemistry? Uh, I could not. Uh, I could not get you. Can you please repeat? I, I agree. I agree with everything that you've said, and I greatly appreciate your comment. Yeah. But how do I? How do I? How do I translate that into chemistry? My appreciation for your your words. Yeah. Uh, for <laughs> translation of translation of what? Uh, translation of uh, life into chemistry. Of, of our thoughts. Of our, our thoughts. Dreams. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I am into that point. Our, our prayers. How, how, yes, do, yes. Exactly. how do we yeah. translate it into chemistry? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Dr. Sarma. You, you are into my query, actually. Uh, you know, it is the brain. It is the brain. Your brain is nothing but also, again, uh, molecular orientations. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, your fluid mechanics, your nervous system from, uh, uh, you know, uh, mutations are signaling, signaling of one information from the brain. 
your thought comprises of uh, molecules or neurons i don't know that brain chemistry but it should be it should be a, it should be a molecules your thought your memory uh, recalling of that memory and the expression of that memory is a molecule there is nothing like life uh, or your uh, or or uh, or your communication or, or our communication is a sensor you know molecules to sensor to the mechanical forces the way you know your computer i am able to listen from you there is no life uh, it is interpretation of uh, uh, you know from molecules to sensor organisms uh, you know in, in engines in engine engines uh, this much of uh, uh, you see my mouth speaks there is a voice there is a uh, there is a uh, you know motions of uh, air molecules uh, that create sound and uh, captured by electronic sensors uh again changes with electrons and uh, you know with semiconductor uh, recognition and connecting to the micro voltage or or some kind of uh, or what is that uh, you know um, some kind of voltage and signaling converting into decoding coding and converting to information it is it is the whole of it is like the way you spoken about the dna True, and also you remember that uh, Dr. Karana's work on the visual system uh, was the yeah. was the next step in, in thinking about the the uh, the brain because mm -hmm. the rod outer segments are the are in the retina in the eye mm -hmm. and the retina in the eye is the end at the end of the optic nerve and the optic nerve mm -hmm. is part of the brain it's yes, an extension yeah, yeah. of the brain and it's a sensor. Yeah. It's the most yeah. important sensor. So if you think about it, Dr. Krana had already identified the most yeah. tractable system for understanding the brain. Yeah. With the retina being an, essentially one part of the brain and the, the yeah. signal transduction system involving rhodopsin and transducin and GTP and calcium, that, that is the basis of how the brain functions. But yeah. how that how that signal yeah. transduction is transmitted to a feeling, you know, it is nerves, it, it is stimulation. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is stimulation. There, there is, yeah, uh, yeah, it is stimulation. Suppose uh, if you have seen a snake, your body reacts on that point. You, you know, similarly, a, a image of image that is created on the mind. Uh, 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 your body is programmed. Your body is again, it's again, uh, it's again from uh, it's a molecules to uh, molecules to nerves to act on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is, and, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I will be in touch that. with you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Please be in touch with you. Yeah. Fine. fine. Thank you, Dr. Sarma. Yeah. Thank you. I, thank you. And all the coordinates. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Samashiro. Uh, there is one more query. Uh, if you allow me, I'll just take that one query as the last query. Uh, what would be the next uh, topic in biology that researchers are very much excited? Maybe this is a very general question. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have Professor Karana here to answer that question for you um, <laughs> because he had the vision <laughs> that some of us would like to have, uh, but uh, maybe the previous question uh, would be a continuation of that uh, in the sense that, um, you know, what is life? Uh, and uh, that that is a question that is being addressed by the field of astrobiology, which until recently was, was not really a mainstream subject, but um, the work of uh, the space agencies, including the Indian Space uh, agency and uh, the NASA here in the United States uh, have made uh, defining life as a very important goal. Uh, life, one of the one of the mantras has been uh, life as we don't know it. We know what life is like, though we cannot, though we cannot recreate it even though we know it, we don't know the, know the evolutionary steps. So that would be very important to be able to understand how, how did the evolutionary uh, transition from, from 
uh, a non-living pre-cell to a living cell occur? And is the kind of life that occurs on Earth the only type of life that exists in the universe? Or could there be a different type of life altogether based on uh, methane lakes or based on silicon or based on other elements? So uh, those are questions which appeal to a basic science uh, mind like mine. However, the other side of the coin is that whenever scientists have studied basic questions, there has always been very uh, uh, good practical outcomes. Say methane lake, whole genetic code and recombinant DNA has improved our health. We can make vaccines against COVID uh, because of the basic work that was pioneered by uh, Dr. Karana and others. So um, I, I do think that uh, the, the next questions in biology should be something very basic, but which we fully expect will result in practical solutions for our lives here and in going into the future. And we can see with the COVID situation that there is a tremendous need for solutions. Uh, we can see with the climate change problem that there are tremendous needs for solutions. So uh, I think your institute sits at exactly the perfect place to be able to address those kinds of societal problems based on curiosity, based on uh, you know, uh, intellectual activity of people everywhere. Uh, well, thank you. Pavan Kumar, can I just... Yeah. Yes, yes, I, I, I just thought of inviting you only to, to give your uh, observation. Really? Actually, uh, Professor Dasarma also worked large uh, in the life in Mars. So, so since the audience like this, uh, we're very excited. Maybe some other time we'll listen to that. But briefly, can you just uh, uh, spell out uh, the life in Mars, which is very unique program uh, we have uh, you have made. So can you just throw some light on that, sir? Uh, surely, I can say a few words about it. Uh, there are missions that are being sent to uh, do sample returns from Mars. And um, this will take about 10 years. I think uh, the target is around 2030. Uh, I think ESA and NASA are working together on a series of missions. And the first one uh, has already been, uh, has been, actually landed on on mars so um uh, it's landed in a region uh of a uh, an ancient river delta where there might have been life so the thought is that the conditions on mars are uh very extreme on the surface maybe too extreme to uh, uh, support life as we know it at least at the present time however there may be areas um uh, where uh, life is, if it existed on Mars, would have taken refuge. And um, those might be uh, subsurface. Uh, they, they could also be in, um, in deposits, in mineral deposits, such as uh, halite. Um, uh, halite, uh, in, on Earth, uh, we, have, uh, we have many, as you know, we have uh, uh, many salt uh, deposits which uh, occurred even uh, in prehistoric Permian era, uh, 250 million years old. And uh, there are inclusions of brine inside of the halite in which there are trapped microorganisms. So if microorganisms ever existed on Mars, then halite deposits on Mars might be a place to look for them. Uh, there's also a lot of water subsurface in Mars. And all of that water is very briny. It's, uh, it has a lot of perchlorate content. And uh, so uh, there are, some of our studies have been uh, exploring how uh, organisms survive in conditions such as those. So we're, we're testing Mars-like conditions on Earth. 
to determine whether uh, life as we know it can survive. <clears throat> so there, it's a it's a very large effort actually. Uh, uh, NASA has made a a very big uh, uh, investment in the area of astrobiology, uh, and of course there are other uh, other reasons to explore Mars uh, and uh, asteroids and and uh, the moon as well. Uh, I know that the the Indian Science uh, Program has a uh, very uh, strong uh, 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 a desire to to uh, do, do lunar landings and so on, and that that could end up with uh, you know lots of benefits, not just in terms of life missions, but also other possible mining and other types of missions on uh, elsewhere. So that's a short that's a short answer. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, sir. And I'm going to watch. Yeah, what, what you say? yeah. yeah. Thank you, Professor Dasyama, for your valuable insights. And now we have come to the end of the program. Before closing, now I invite Dr. N.K. Dell, Head Environment and Sustainability, to give closing remarks and also to propose the vote of thanks. Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. So good morning, Professor Dasyama, and good evening to all of my staff members, all heads of the department and our beloved director, Professor Basu, and uh, my friend, Dr. Shubuddhi, and Dr. Pavan Kumar, and my staff members, student friends, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of our laboratory, CSR MMT, and my, uh, my own, and my on behalf of my department, Environment Sustainability, we are very much thankful to you, sir, for delivering an outstanding lecture uh, to celebrate the uh, birth centenary of Nobel laureate Professor Hargobin Koranasar. And <clears throat> we learned many more from your outstanding, brilliant lecture. And our students got inspired, including me also. We are motivated. The way you presented part wise, part one, part two, and part three. Before I propose vote of thanks, it is my duty as a head of the department to inform you, sir what are the activities are going on in my department within one or two minutes. Sir, our department is actively working on monitoring and assessment of coastal environment, atmospheric pollution, aerosol monitoring, environmental impact assessment study, industrial state solid waste utilization, industrial solid waste utilization, wastewater treatment, bioremediation, defluorination of potable water, Construction of materials, that means uh, uh, bricks from flyers and admon, green synthesis of nanoparticles, bioleaching of metals, biofuel, biodiversity assessment, self assembled DNA nanostructure for biotherapeutics and biomedical application, water quality assessment. Recently, we got that NAVL accreditation from Quality Council of Government of India for Environmental Biological Laboratory. Environment Chemical Laboratory. We have 13 scientists for technical officers and uh, <clears throat> uh, 45 students. Sir. In this virtual platform, I request on behalf of my department and on behalf of my director and behalf of all my heads of department, it will be very honor and pleasure to have a student exchange program within your university and my institution so that students get benefit. The young students, young PhD scholars of my department, whole IMMT can get benefit. Coming to the proposed vote of thanks, once again, sir, we are very much thankful. All the CSR IMMTians are very much thankful for giving your valuable time in the early morning in USA for delivering an outstanding lecture, which has really motivated us, really inspired us, and really we can know what is life and what is molecule. And Directly or indirectly, all, uh, all the CSR IMMT members, including all heads of department, have contributed to make the program a grand success. We are very much thankful to everybody. Last but not least, we are very much thankful to our CNME head, Dr. Satyaj Rath, and his entire team to nicely prepare the design, flyer, and innovation and wider circulation through YouTube, 
MS team so that globally people can attend this program. And last but not least, on behalf of CSR MMT, once again, I am really thankful to your valuable talk, giving completely motivated to us, inspired to us, all the CSR MMTNs. And last but not least, with a very short time, my colleague, Dr. Shubuddhi, who is heading that DNA Nanotechnology Application Laboratory, followed by our patent officer, Dr. Pavan Kumar, very short time, then nicely with due permission of our beloved director, Professor Basu, very short time, they arrange this program and a winner to celebrate a great no novel released Professor Haragubind Khurana on, on behalf of the department. I am really thankful to both of them and really I am motivated and inspired that at least some of our students should get benefit uh, uh, through student exchange program. And uh, time to time, we'll be in touch with you, sir. We need mm -hmm. your blessings, co-person, for the better growth of the department and the better growth of the institution, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank your you. kind kindness. Thank you Thank so you much. Again. Thank you. Thank you, sir, again for accepting your invitation and being delivered this wonderful lecture, the birth centenary origin in the memory of your teacher, mentor, Professor Hargobind Purana. Uh, we thank all of you, those who joined, and maybe later on also people can view the YouTube link lecture, so it will be recorded all as well. So thank you. With this, maybe with permission of Professor uh, Sahu, we can end yeah. today's sir. meeting. So, yes. Sir, you are mute. Uh, Sir, you are mute, uh, yeah. Professor Sahu. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Siladit. <laughs> yeah. it, has, it has been a wonderful uh, talk, and uh, our we are richly benefited with this, and we will be having uh, cooperation with you uh, from our students' group and from your students' group. We're going to have a lot of excellent program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, the Thank coordinator. You. Thank you, the, all this peer uh, staff who has uh, contributed nicely for this workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we can uh, end the meeting end here. So thank you all again. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I will. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, it's really nice <laughs> that you agreed, and it's a great journey indeed from the early 50s to the span of yeah. 60 years you have traveled in 60 minutes <laughs> so that's good thank you yeah yeah and I, it's it sounds like you have a wonderful institute there um you know uh yeah i was born in calcutta so you know it, bhuvaneshwar is not not too far uh, <laughs> and uh you know it, so it's been, been so you've been to odisha professor you have been to odisha bhuvaneshwar anytime before no, I haven't actually. I haven't. Okay. Um, but um, but you know, it, it just sounds like the science you're doing there is wonderful. And nowadays, uh, with uh, the links that we have, you know, the the possibility of you know ha having a video link where you can actually right. talk to students. I have a number of students in in India who uh, I'm uh, mentoring okay. Who okay. remotely, uh, mostly bioinformatic work. Okay. So it's it's possible to do quite a lot uh, remotely these days. So uh, you know, I would I would enjoy uh, you know staying in touch. Um, yes, yes. I, I I also thought you said you have also given uh, the Corona lectures in in the past. Yes. Perhaps <laughs> we should write a perhaps we should write an article together uh, on the yes. life of uh, of, of you know, that, Dr. Corona. Uh, that thought came to mind. I don't know. I haven't seen your slides, but you you saw mine. I you know. Uh, uh, I'm sure that we would complement each other in, in the way in which we would. That would be great uh, for many students, right? And yeah. particularly the love culture of Corona, the one you mentioned, you know, like daily from Monday to Sunday, it's really very inspiring. And uh -huh. <laughs> the bugs we cannot forget the secret bugs. <laughs> <laughs> <Not over. laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, this this lecture gave me the opportunity to think about that time. Right. And to, to to recall things that you know happened so long ago, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it it's it's touching and you know he was a very special man. It you know not I like you said it's it would be easy to get students to come in on a Saturday uh, to, to to discuss science, uh, <laughs> but he he was able to do it. We we used to get up and say yeah we'll have some donuts you know <laughs> that was the benefit of. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, very, very yeah. inspiring. Yeah. We are really very much inspired and motivated from your talk. And maybe regarding the DNA or regarding the computational work, uh, as I mentioned before, the metal interaction with biomolecules, particularly for protein and DNA. And their computational work uh, plays a very important. And maybe yes. we will get keep your guidance to make it a proper shape and to understand really uh, how do they uh, interact and monitor the structure as well as the function of uh, any biomolecule? So oh, that and it's relevant to uh, the uh, archaeal system because they are growing in such high salinity. There are lots of other metal ions, Excellent. and I didn't mention to you, but my father was a uh, he worked for the Indian Geological Survey uh, for many years, and he was a he was an inorganic chemist. Um, so I, I do have it, and I worked in his lab when I was a when I was small. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I have an appreciation of of metals from from my from my youth, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the the involvement of metals in stabilizing alternate DNA structures. That's yeah. and we discussed that briefly. Yeah. So I would be happy to continue our discussion in future. Uh, yeah. So uh, in any way I can help, uh, I would be more than happy to do so. Yeah. Nice. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, here is uh, Dr. Pavan Kumar. Actually, he has done his PhD from Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, Hyderabad. That is another sister CSR laboratory. And his mentor, uh, um, Dr. Chandrasekhar, he is now heading the Department of Science and Technology Government of India. Very recently, uh, maybe he was the secretary. Yes, one month before. Month. He was earlier the director of AC. Yes. So, and he has worked in diverse areas, particularly the co-vaccine, uh, the therapeutics vaccine. The adjuvant, uh, he was the pioneer in getting the adjuvant done at IICT for the large scale vaccination program uh, in India. Uh, that yeah. was the very credit of IICT, and Dr. Chandrasekhar was leading. <laughs> and we are really happy. Yes, uh, in fact, I am an yeah. organic chemist. Even uh, during my postdoctoral state, IICT, we worked on the synthesis of hybrid nucleotides. Uh, we were working in collaboration with CCMB, with uh, Rajan Professor. Uh, with uh, Dr. Rajan Shankar Narayanan. So they wanted to study some RNA proofreading mechanism. They, uh, they were looking for some artificial uh, nucleotides. So in fact, uh, we worked on that. And finally, we could able to give about uh, 30 milligrams of the compound. Even mm -hmm. making 30 milligrams of compound itself was a very difficult task for us. Because they are very <laughs> polar, very much polar, and we need to separate them. It, it was a very huge task. But finally, we could give. So that is where, uh, like, we could learn some uh, intricacies in synthesis of uh, these nucleotide and related compounds. That's that's wonderful, and you know, of course, the the tremendous success uh, of the uh, mRNA vaccine for COVID, that is again using, and I think they stabilize the RNA by having some uh, uh, unnatural uh, uh, nucleotides in that. MRNA. I'm not an expert on that, but you probably know more. Uh -huh. uh, but there, there are there, are, uh, there are some. I think tremendous opportunities, and uh, India obviously is playing a leading role in vaccine uh, uh, research uh, in the world. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that you have a connection uh, to that that yes. work as well. Another thing, sir, uh, as we discussed last, you know, uh, last time. Regarding the left handed DNA, Z DNA, which is mm -hmm. more immunogenic than B DNA, as mm -hmm. I got yeah. some literature, yes. And for the adjuvant, one of the criteria to have preferring better adjuvant is more immunogenicity. So, uh, can we think of uh, using the Z DNA as an adjuvant so that you know more immune response? Of course, the antigen will be there, uh, maybe protein or anything, but instead of uh, using other adjuvants, 
can the z dna be an adjuvant uh, to you know stimulate the immune response since it is very very immunogenic than b dna uh, do you think uh, that uh, such a hypothesis we can try or hmm. yeah i haven't i haven't thought about that but that um has has there been any uh, reports of that or is that a, a, a new yes. idea in terms People have, uh, you know, when people have developed the first, uh, like Alexander Ritz group, uh, yes, yes. the ZDNA work, and they have put the ZDNA to the, you know, to generate the antibody. So right, right. The, they have never expected that DNA will generate the antibody. So B right. DNA will not generate antibody, but the ZDNA right. is very monogenic. So taking right. that clue in mind, I was thinking that uh, instead of using other adjuvants, of course, mm. uh, there are many adjuvants, but can, mm. uh, ZDNA is not yet explored as adjuvant for the vaccines. So yeah. uh, since it's more immunogenic and uh, we have actually, you know, series of ZDNA been stabilized by the metal ions, particularly very low concentration of metal ions, because right. maybe people have not thought uh, earlier, uh, high concentration of metal ions, like, you know, three to yes. four molar of sodium chloride or, you know, uh, potassium, yeah. that making the ZDNA, which is not very safe even for the adjuvant. Right. But, but we can use millimolar concentration, even micromolar right. concentration of uh, salt that would right. be easily used as adjuvant. So right. that's what right. one thought. Maybe uh, we'll discuss with uh, others. Yeah, yeah. So I actually have a former student who did the Z any work in our lab, and actually using antibodies that were produced. Okay. In, in a collaboration with Alex Rich. Alex Rich was around the corner from Karana's lab, also. Yes, yes. I am. Uh, so I, I, I knew him as well. Um, okay. But so uh, the, uh, the the gentleman's name is uh, Stoller, mm -hmm. uh, David David Stoller. He was at Tufts University, and he he generated the antisera against ZDNA, and which oh. my my student John Kim John Min Kim he used that. Uh, I, I I will send you the paper. Um, okay. So I'm actually in touch with John Min. He's he's a professor in Busan, in okay. South Korea now. And he's actually very interested in the vaccine uh, development, okay. uh, but using now using the uh, nanoparticles. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a paper that's uh, under review where we've uh, done some collaborative work. So I, I mean, if, if you think that there is a yeah. interest in uh, adjuvants and vaccines mm -hmm. and materials, yeah. that's a, that's definitely an area that I think we could we could establish a collaboration and. Uh, I, I can't imagine a better target with the world dealing with uh, this pandemic for years now. Uh, yes. And it looks like it's going to be there for the foreseeable future. So uh, I think thinking and, and outside of the box and thinking about new ideas, uh, you know, I would I would really enjoy that. So right. I, I would I, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that further. I will send you the paper, those two yes. papers in JBC in uh, in the mid 90s, because yes. it it was done to establish the conditions in vivo for forming ZDNA. So uh, but I, I would like to take that one step further uh, uh, with your expertise on uh, and metals. Um, I did a little bit of work on chromium, but I, I don't think chromium is the one It would probably be uh, platinum or something. Yeah. Oh, what, what, which 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 uh, heavy metals are stabilizing ZDNA most? Uh, uh, heavy metal. We we mostly work on rare earth elements like lanthanide series, lanthanum, cerium, osmium, gadolinium. Those are the elements very low concentration, and those are even in gadolinium used as um, the dyes in MRI. So that is mostly used in medical science. So uh, rare earth elements would not be difficult, uh, and particularly low concentration. So mm -hmm. we can. Think of and you know we can explore. This is a new areas where uh, JDN can be better. And adjuvant is always a challenge to get a better vaccine. Yes. So the antigen yes. is important. Of course, the vaccine is you know dependent upon the adjuvant. Right. And, and na natural natural products are always advantageous because you would expect fewer side effects and yes. less toxicity. Right. So yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Now I was curious to know whether whether you had gotten that from work that was ongoing somewhere or in your laboratory or it, it's an entirely new idea that you're coming it's up with. Entirely, it's entirely new. I'm thinking of yeah. last you know, one, two years, but I'm okay. not start <laughs> just discussing, you know, whether the idea is really noble people will appreciate it or not. That's actually yeah. 
um, but uh, since you appreciate really uh, i'm a bit confident that yes <laughs> we can take over then that could the reason could be why not people have not started earlier that could be a reason that high concentration of metal ion was the only medium to generate uh, z dna so uh, and rare earth elements are very new and uh, we are the first maybe group to show that rare earth elements are the inducer of very low concentration be, being their trivalence so uh, and uh, we, we both have such repeat sequence z dna like cg repeats or even branch dna structures those are also very unique longer mm -hmm. dna those are yeah. very monolithic so and they are very stable so right. that's what we can try maybe for such applications right right and i well, remember sir please sorry go ahead no no just i was telling in early 80s when he was there in mit that time only alexander is started those uh, gd in yes. work <laughs> so yes. he might have been uh, <laughs> excited but yeah, i know was, there was a lot of excitement uh, right. You know, I, in fact, I, I remember meeting uh, Alexander Rich at a party uh, at, for new graduate students, uh, and he was walking around saying, uh, you know, this was right after he discovered ZDNA, he said, I, I found the secret to cancer, uh, okay. because he thought that ZDNA was, the, you know, was going to explain, uh, you know, carcinogen, carcinogenesis, it, it didn't turn out to be the case. Right. I even considered for a short moment uh, possibly uh, working as a, a graduate student with him. Uh, okay. But uh -huh. but 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 Professor Karan is you know he had such a you know long term uh, I had such a long term admiration that I, I I went to his laboratory. But yeah, Alex Rich was quite he's a quite a flamboyant and uh, a character. So. Uh, <laughs> my, my wife just my wife is just telling me something but no i i think what we can do uh is 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 continue this discussion maybe we can exchange a few articles i think uh, I, I would be happy to follow up um i i find the zoom uh, or uh teams uh platform to be very productive yes yes, yes. because it's, it's just it's, the time yes. very specific time you don't have to go anywhere yeah. You don't have to fly somewhere, um, <laughs> so it's very, very productive, and and it's very easy to share uh, documents uh, and ideas. So um, you know, uh, it sounds like you're in a wonderful uh, environment there, and uh, uh, we would we would love to uh, we would love to continue the conversation with you. <laughs> nice, so nice of you said. Thank you, sure. and certainly we'll take it forward, exchanging the articles and the concept node or ideas. Once it is done, maybe we'll initiate some initial work. And uh, we have the group here with Pavan Kumar and other biologists. I will discuss and let you know the progress. And also uh, with your guidance, maybe we'll formulate one project to move further. Uh, something exciting in uh, new areas. Maybe kind of chemical biology, kind of. Yes, right? chemical biology. This yes. exactly thing, you know, the chemical biology. Yes. Really nice. And be fitting to the you know, pandemic scenario of COVID. So maybe we will appreciate if something comes good and inspiring. Yeah. So maybe with this uh, <laughs> in the morning hour, really we disturb you, sir. <laughs> no, not at all. Now, now it's it's uh, the middle of the morning, so it's fine. Uh, right, right. But I had a I had a I had a, another talk late last night, which is why I want, didn't want to start this too early. But it's also late for you. So I appreciate your accommodating the time, and I hope that the students uh, got a little something yes. out of it. I, I, I you know, um, yes, sir. Yes. Very much, very much. And uh, in fact, a few people were asking in the chat box: Is it possible uh, for you to share the slides because they're, they're of a great inspiration for them? <laughs> yeah. So if possible, you can if you can share them, then they would be more happy. Yeah. They, they will see that in the uh, YouTube. Uh, yes, yes. YouTube in the video, video too, right? Would you yes. would you be posting the video? Yes, it is already recorded. We'll post share the video with uh, yeah. share with our students. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds wonderful. Right. So nice. So, well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank sir. you. We'll, thank you. Thank you. Okay. We, we'll, we'll be in touch again. Sure. 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 Thank you. Sir. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Sir.